Russia had the right to invade Ukraine. How did nobody tell me about this? How am I just finding out about this? I should not just be finding out about this. For those of you who don't know, uh, Norman Finkelstein is a historian who has written a, uh, some books uh, specializing on the Israel-Palestine conflict, generally from the pro-Palestinian perspective. And he's been going around doing a lot of lectures for a while, but he's really blown up in the public consciousness during this last wave of violence as a lot of uh, interviews with him became popular, as a bunch of clips of him on TikTok became popular, and I believe on YouTube Shorts as well, uh, and his, his general commentary about the war was shared around. And his books were cited as books that people should go read if they wanted to learn about the war, instead of say, like one of the Israeli new historians or say uh, some historian from a, from a different country or some other historian, they were recommending his books. Now, Honestly, let me be for real with you. I don't know if I want to get in the dirt with the dude over this issue. Uh, and I honestly, I've listened to him talk about it somewhat. There's some things we agree on and probably other things we disagree on. But I haven't read the books he has. I haven't gone to the universities that he has gone to. I have not, uh, you know, s smiled in the smug manner that he has smiled in. And so I feel like I can leave that to other people. And I feel like other people could probably handle it better than I. But, but I do feel like I could talk about this guy who's not a historian on Eastern European history. He's not a historian on Russian history, not a historian on Ukrainian history, not a, stor not a historian on particularly like NATO history. This isn't his area of expertise. Not saying that he has never dabbled in this area. It's just not his main area of focus and is certainly not what he is known for. And so since I saw he dabbled his toes in this, I thought, okay, this is much more my area since I've been covering this war for the last two going on three years now on the ground and off the ground. And nobody told me about this. Because people told me, I remember hearing a recent conversation that his beliefs about Ukraine were wacky or not good. And so I Googled and looked around, and this is what I found from Norman Finkelstein. Now, what's interesting about this tweet is this is not from before the invasion, uh, February 24th, 2022, big invasion. That's in comparison to the other invasion that was back in 2014. This is in the middle of the war. This is from like a year ago. No, hell, not even a year ago. This is like eight, 10 months old, that range. So this is a year into the war. So this is after Bucha. This is after Irpin. Uh, this is after Izium and the largest mass grave discovered in Europe since the Yugoslav genocide. Over 440 bodies discovered there. Uh, this is after the battle for Mariupol. Um, this is, you know, this is after many of the throes of the war. Uh, I mean, this is not before the completion of the Battle of Divka, but I mean, this is after the Battle of Bakhmut. This saw a lot of the war. So, what's really interesting about this and what we're about to watch is Norman had time to consider all the factors. Norman had time to not only review all the history of the war, but he had time to look at, okay, now the war, the big war has started, the full invasion has started, and it's been going on for well over a year now. I can review what caused it, motivation, speeches, and this is the conclusion he came to with all of that insight. Russia had the right to invade Ukraine. Russia, let me just repeat this again for the people in the back. Russia had the right to invade Ukraine. From Norman Finkelstein, anti colonialist professor. So I wanted to watch this video um, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, but primarily being that this is a bold statement from Norman Finkelstein, especially considering this is not his area of expertise. This is a bold statement a year and a half into the war, as we found out a lot more and certainly has gotten a lot more attention, other Russian motives outside of say, NATO expansion or what was talked about regularly before the full invasion of 2022. Uh, I think it's particularly, I mean, the, I, I, I could go into all the details as to why it's surprising to me, but skipping all of that, I just want to go watch the video because this is not something I expected from normal Finkelstein. I don't know how this opinion has flown under the radar, but 
I had somebody say when I brought this video up, Dylan, this must be out of context. This must be out of context. This is some clip chimping nonsense. Now, again, this is his Twitter, Twitter account. So if this is clip chimped, by the way, let me just put this at the forefront. He clip chimped himself. He clip chimped himself. So if this is clip chimped, this would be equivalent of me taking a, like a, a, a where I say, oh, we're going to kill him. And then we take that and post that on. I, I edit that and post that on Twitter. And people are like, whoa, you're going to kill him. And then I add the last few seconds on the football field, right? I, that would be him climp chimping himself if it is climp chimping. And if this isn't his position, and this is about to be a, you know, a, a complete 180, and this is actually a rhetorical device to bring attention or views or whatever, um, this is still his fault for, for presenting it that way. But that's not what he's going to do. That's not what, we're, what he's going to do. So let's watch the video. Let's listen to why Norman Finkelstein thinks that the Russians had the right to invade Ukraine. The, I already watched some of it off stream to make sure because I had to watch some of it off stream to make sure like this isn't going to be a bait and switch and no it was not a bait and switch let's watch I'll begin my remarks in the Ukraine by it's can I give you guys a warning now this isn't true in all instances sometimes people just verbally slip and other times people know none the wiser but a good warning sign you can check for when somebody's about to give a bad take on the war in Ukraine is when they don't call Ukraine Ukraine, they call Ukraine the Ukraine. And the reason why is while, again, this isn't true in all instances, the Ukraine is how Ukraine is referred to in a lot of Russian media, particularly Russian state media, Russian government aligned media, because they're trying to not separate Ukraine from Russia. And if you just say, and so it's the Ukraine, as in it's the Ukrainian region or like the Ukrainian region of Russia. And by just saying Ukraine, it kind of gives it its own separate, independent, and ugh. anyway, I'm not saying that's true of what's happening here. I don't know. I'm just saying that it's kind of a canary in the coal mine for uh, brain aids. I know that just before this program began, I was watching a presentation by Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, he was speaking. Jeffrey Sachs was an economist that advised the Yeltsin administration after the collapse of the Soviet Union as they tried to privatize and move away from the Soviet style economy as the economy was actively falling apart into a private capitalistic style of economy. And obviously due to the high amounts of homelessness, high amounts of inflation, high amounts of unemployment, high cost of food. Um, I mean, uh, increase in violent crime, increase in young women uh, selling their bodies, uh, increase in childhood homelessness. Uh, many people view this period in time to be quite catastrophic when it comes to Russians' economics. And in fact, many people point towards that being where Putin got a lot of the source of his power by pointing to that period of instability and then pointing to himself as a source of stability. Um, uh, just wanted to give that context for Jeffrey Sachs. Not saying that he was the cause of all of it, just saying that he is not widely viewed popularly in Russia due to that history uh, and due to him, you know, being a champion of that privatization. ...to a Chilean audience. And Jeffrey Sachs, as many of you know, is a very respected economist, and he's been very active on the international scene since his late 20s. He was actually, I think, for worse, not for better. He was a major advisor to Boris Yeltsin beginning in 1992. And in my opinion, but that's not for now. Okay, you guys don't care if I speed it up, right? And I'm... I'm sorry, uh, I sometimes do it too, especially after I smoked a little bit. I don't know if Norm smokes a lot, I don't know. But can we speed up this to like 1.5? And I'm not trying to be me, I just wanna, it's a 24 minute video, I don't wanna be super slow about this. He is significantly culpable for the catastrophe that ensued in Russia under Yeltsin's leadership, a catastrophe of a magnitude such that you could say Yeltsin with the advice of Jeffrey Sachs, or I should say Jeffrey Sachs, through Yeltsin, was single, singularly responsible for bringing Vladimir Putin into power. Wow, that's incredible. Um, and just not, I mean, it's horribly, I mean, 
I could just say it's not true and move on uh, and just leave it at that, that Yeltsin and Jeffrey Sachs did not single-handedly, as Norm claims, bring uh, Putin to power. Um, but I, I guess I should give this more time. There's a lot of people you could point to that help got Putin to power. Uh, you could point at his election campaign. You could put uh, point at the people around him. You could point at Putin himself and his own work and climbing up the ranks. You could point at the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Chechnya and the failures connected with that, which, by the way, is not just that's not a, a Jeffrey Sachs uh, uh, advice. I don't think Jeffrey Sachs told Yeltsin to invade Chechnya, which is a position, by the way, that would have not just been taken by Yeltsin. That's also a position that would have been taken by Putin because Putin then did go on to invade Chechnya as well. But of course, I would say many of the people I would point to first before anybody, before Yeltsin, before the rest of them, would probably be the Soviet elite that mismanaged the Soviet Union into the ground, creating the economic conditions, creating the economic collapse that made people believe that they had to restructure the economy to change it. They had to change it into something else. If you want to talk about who brought about the chaos, well, maybe the, the people who made the mess. I'm just... I'm not trying to remove Jeffrey Sachs of any blame, and I'm certainly not trying to remove Yeltsin of any blame. I'm just saying that saying that he's singularly responsible as a historian. Now, I don't know what the nature of this conversation is. Maybe it's a lot more informal than a historical conversation or an academic conversation, but just we need to hold our horses a little bit. But that's another time and another place. I mentioned Jeffrey Sachs because the question of Ukraine obviously came up during his presentation, and I was surprised, but also if I can use the word, I was gratified to hear that he said, and now I think I'm quoting him verbatim, but you all can check. All you have to do is go to YouTube and enter Jeffrey Sachs, Chile. Uh, he said, I think I'm quoting him verbatim. He said, the U.S. caused the war in Ukraine. He didn't limit himself to saying the U.S. provoked the war. He said the U.S. caused the war in U.S. And again, I would say not only is this, I mean, again, I could get into all of the details about why I don't even, I, I would somewhat even disagree with the classification of provoke, depending on how you mean to use the word. If you just mean like cause and effect, as in, you know, I waved at a, at a schizophrenic, then the schizophrenic beat me over the head with a frying pan. Like you could say I provoked in some way because they thought I was swinging maybe a knife or cyanide at them, but provoked in the idea that they did, like, I don't know what they mean by provoked, you know? But again, I come back to the same position of this is incredibly reductive. Even if I was to tussle with the idea of how much blame the United States has, which I don't believe you can remove all blame, even if the question is the United States, after making its commitments to defend Ukraine in the 90s, after asking them to give up to the nuclear arsenal to the Russians, at the Russians' request, because the Russians were floating around the idea of a military operation into Ukraine to take them back by force, um, after we made those commitments, we should have stayed. We, we should have stood by those commitments. We could stand by those commitments. Sorry, I got a message quick. Let me check something. Okay, sorry, I, got, I lost track. Can we go back? The war in Ukraine. He didn't limit himself to saying the U.S. provoked the war. Oh, yeah, but back to this. It's reductive. Even if I was to tussle with the idea of how much blame the United States has, it's reductive. It's reductive to say the U.S. caused it. And to have somebody who is supposed to be a respective economist say that, say that in that way, I don't agree with. I think it's horribly reductive. Are we really like if we if we go back and go? You know what? I'll let him finish this question about Jeffrey Sachs because then I could I could get a little bit more in depth. He said the U.S. caused the war in Ukraine, and for those of you who follow these debates, these discussions, it's a crude, in my opinion, it's a critical distinction because many people, obviously not a majority, but a significant number of people, have been willing to say that. The U.S. and NATO, the U.S. provoked the war. However, they stopped short of saying the U.S. caused the war, but instead say 
notwithstanding the provocations by the U.S. and NATO, notwithstanding the provocations. By the way, if we accept the premise U.S. caused the war, then we're removing all blame from the Russians. Let's be clear. If it's the United States that caused it, it wasn't the Russians that caused it. It was the United States that caused it. We didn't provoke it and then make the Russians act and then they invade. We caused it. It's our fault, not the Russians' fault. That we're taking the responsibility for the war, which the Russians started twice back in 2014 and in 2022, invading in both instances where we did not deploy troops in both instances, in the first time responding with sanctions and intelligence assistance to the Ukrainians as they annexed Crimea, and we told the Ukrainians not to put up a fight over it after the Ukrainians offered to negotiate over it. I just, again, this is, this is horribly reductive. This is horribly reductive. They say that the Russian invasion... Of- I mean, I wouldn't even say, again, I, I wouldn't use the word reductive. I'm being nice by using the word reductive. I would just say straight up mis- misinformative. Like, you're just, mis- you're just misinforming an audience that would listen to this. But reductive is the nice way I can put it. Ukraine was criminal. And I'm not aware of anyone except for myself. Uh, and I think Sachs comes pretty close when he says cause the war, uh, my position has been from day one of the war that Russia had the right to attack. There it is. But, and it's not a big but, but it's a but. There's a difference between having a right and exercising that right. And I have said from the beginning, Russia had the right to attack. However, I cannot say with any kind of certainty that it was a wise or a prudent thing to attack. To me, those are separate questions. But on the, let's call it on the moral question, it's my view they had the right to attack. Man, so th- this is the interesting thing is he could try to pitch it just as like the Mearsheimer realist angle, but the moral right to attack, what a statement. Not that they just had the right to attack in some vague sense, but specifically tying it to it being the moral right for Russia to attack Ukraine. That, that's just absolutely fascinating. I mean, that's quite a statement. I mean, even, even some of the most hardline Russophile, uh, Russian, Russian apologists that you can see in Western media, they will usually curb themselves, say, no, the Russians are awful. I understand they're bad. They shouldn't have invaded. It's terrible that they invaded. But, you know, reality is, reality is, we just got to kind of carve up Ukraine. It is a part of what it is. It is what it is. You know, I mean, we partially provoked. No, he, he is avoiding all of that. He is avoiding any of this conversation of, well, it's not a question of morality. It's a question of how do we save the most life. He's just avoiding all of it. No, they had the moral right to cross the border into Ukraine and march on Kiev. Now, he does put a but there, and this is why I think somebody earlier said, and you took this out of context, he says, just because they have the moral right doesn't mean it is prudent or a good idea to. But that is not a question, that that still doesn't make this any less reprehensible. But if, if, if somebody argues that it was morally right for, say, the Chinese to invade Vietnam, but it wasn't strategically prudent, That doesn't mean, that's not, that's, to me, that's still an awful thing to say. If it was, it was horrible for the Germans to invade Poland, but not prudent, the person who says it was okay for them to invade Poland, morally, I still think that's obviously wrong. I don't think that there's any legal foundation, and I gotta throw out there, Norman Finkelstein is somebody who cites international law, somebody who cites the UN, somebody who cites uh, contributions to the UN, speeches at the UN, somebody who cares about international law. There is no legal justification for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Back in 2014, in the annexation of Crimea, when Igor Gherkin admitted to holding uh, Crimean politicians at gunpoint and having them dissolve the Crimean parliament, or the big invasion in 2022 when they marched on Kiev, They don't have a legal justification, but I also don't think they have a moral justification. So the legal justification, I don't know if we're going to get into here. I didn't watch all of this. I watched some of this to get an idea of, is this going to be a bait and switch? Is he going to say Russians had the right to invade Ukraine, but not really? But no, no, it's... He stands on it. He stands on his on his principle that the Russians had the moral right to invade Ukraine. Now, let's listen as to why. No. Now, remember, the conversation is 
The Russians have the moral right to invade. The question, so let's be clear. The question is not, has Ukraine ever done a naughty? The question is not, has Ukraine ever said anything mean or done anything aggressive or have any bad people in it? That's not the question. The question is, and the topic is now, and the statement from him is that the Russians had the moral right to invade Ukraine. I want to remember that because I want to make the point because we're gonna probably run into a lot of this, is that if somebody has the moral right to say go into a country and to denazify it, you could not make said argument if you have Nazis in your army invading to do the denazification. I cannot say that I care about anti-black violence if in my uh, racial unity team that I've sent out to try to unite the community, I've put in members of the Klan. I don't think that would represent somebody who genuinely cares. I also don't think that the Russians, you know, appointing a fascist to be a senator of occupied Zaporizhia and compare the domestic population of Ukraine to apes and monkeys and Secretary of State Lloyd Austin because he's a black man and that type of racist comparison is as old as time. Uh, anyway, just, just to put that out there, the question is about the moral right. That's the statement he made, the moral right. Let's move on. Let's move forward from here. What I would like to do in this few minutes that we're going to talk about the Ukraine and then hearing from you is to make an analogy and then see how you react to it. Uh, my area of professional expertise is the Israel-Palestine conflict. And so yeah, maybe you should have stayed in it, in that area. Just this, you know, again, I have not looked at the, at the depth of his work on the Israel-Palestine topic, but there seems to be a problem like with Jordan Peterson when professors leave that realm and they just start kind of shooting the shit in other areas. Jordan Peterson had that problem when he started talking about the war in Ukraine. He tried to make it a, he tried to integrate the war on woke and stuff like that. And you just you start making extrapolations and conclusions that you just don't have evidence for. You start saying things that you don't know a lot about. Just again, we haven't watched the whole video yet, but I'm just saying that I've seen a trend in professors in the public sphere recently at least at least professors that commentate on politics i'm going to make a comparison with that conflict or an analogy so a lot of you will not remember for reasons of age but the critical turning point in the israel palestine conflict came in 1967 the 1967 war sometimes called the six day war but we'll just call it the june 1967 war now, there's no question, as a factual matter, that Israel fired the first shot. Israel denied it for about a week that it fired the first shot. But uh, after about a week or two weeks, I can't remember now with precision, Israel frankly admitted, because the evidence was overwhelming, that they fired the first shot. However, they claimed that they had a right to launch the attack on the neighboring Arab countries they being Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. And their argument went something like this. Ali Aden, who was the foreign minister of Israel at the time, in his memoir, he had a famous chapter called To Live or to Die. To Live or to Die. And in this chapter, he builds up a scenario such that Israel had no choice. So he says, number one, that is that Egypt had sealed the Straits of Tehran, that's a waterway that led to a port in Israel's south, and he said in his famous metaphor... No, the only port in Israel's south. He said after the sealing of the Straits of Tehran, Israel... You could call it a blockade of, the, of that area, whatever you want to call it. ...was now breathing with one lung. Then he said, Egypt had moved approximately 100,000 troops into the Sinai, the Egyptian Sinai, and they were poised to attack. And then he said, at the end of May, Israel signed- Now remember that he's, this is all built up as a comparison, right? I don't want to get into the specifics of the causes between the 1967 war, uh, the poss possibility of like attack on Israel multi pro What I don't want to get into, that, again, is not what we're concentrating on. What we're concentrating on is right now, though, this is somehow supposed to go into a comparison to Ukraine. Now, I just want to note something, that the Ukrainians did not move 100,000 
soldiers in a position to make it look like they were going to invade Russia. And they certainly didn't also blockade a Russian port in, say, like St. Petersburg and block them from accessing it. Certainly not a port that made up for, you know, the entirety of the ports in the country south, because that port that was blocked was the only port that Israel had in itself. So I'm just, just saying that these comparisons are like a lot of historical comparisons. There's a lot of nuances and ab about these cornucopia of issues that d just cannot be broken down quickly this way. Excuse me, Egypt signed a agreement, a joint agreement with Jordan, an alliance aimed at Israel. So he takes this accumulation of facts Israel is breathing with one lung. Egypt is poised to attack. It has 100,000 troops in the Sinai at the end of May. Oh, also, can I throw out there, Norman Finkelstein, and I'm being a kind of a cunt, but I, I think I deserve to be one. Norman Finkelstein made a lot of noise about the ICJ ruling and how high the standard is for them to say plausible, that it's plausible for Israel to be engaging in genocide in Gaza. Now, again, the plausible thing just means that there's enough evidence to warrant an investigation, and now they're going to look into it to see if it's true or not, okay? That was his position on that, and when he was debating Destiny, he was debating uh, uh, Benny Morris on that show with Lex Friedman. He was doing that. That was his prerogative. What does he think about the ICJ ruling putting a wanted warrant on Putin's head for the kidnapping of Ukrainian children? What about the ruling saying that these this invasion's illegal? I just just something I'm thinking about. I'm just th like are there two different standards here that are being applied? An agreement is struck between Egypt and Jordan, a defense pact is struck between them and he says when you take this accumulation when you take this accumulation of facts that israel had no option but to attack and it fired the first shot now as it turned out it's easy to demonstrate that all of the claims israel made were flat out false but that's not going to concern me now. I've extensively documented it in various publications, as have many, many other historians, in particular Israeli historians, but that's not going to concern me now. My point is, were the facts true that Israel was facing a uh, to live or to die situation, were, that, were those facts true, uh, then, it would seem to me that Israel would have a case for firing the first shot. The, the, you know, the main objective of every state is the survivability of the state and to increase its, uh, you know, make sure it has decent enough security so that its survivability is intact. Whether or not they're getting power for power's sake or they're just trying to increase its security to a moderate amount to make sure that they secure their state, that changes depending on whether you're a defensive realist, you're an offensive realist, or what school of thought you have, but everybody agrees that the state, its goal is to survive, or well, most people agree at least. In fact, in fact, if you go back and look at the record, very few people immediately after the war, when the facts were not yet known, except everybody knew Israel launched the attack, they fired the first shot, very few people were willing to criticize Israel because the facts seemed to convey a, as Abba Aden put it, or a do or die situation. Okay, so now he's going to tie it over to Ukraine. Let's see. So I would say that in the case of Russia and Ukraine, the facts are true. Those facts being number one. By the way, before we get into this, to be clear, the position of Norman Finkelstein is that, hey, remember when the Israelis said that they had to, you know, do the six day war because of the blockade on their southern port, even though he won't call it a blockade. And due to the moving of all these troops and the uh, the threat of an invasion on Israel to put their existence at stake, you know, that's a bunch of crock of shit. But when the Russians said it, they were being honest. They were telling the truth. That is the position 
Okay, let's be clear. His position is when the Israeli said it, nonsense, bull, a bunch of horse hockey. When the Russians said it, actually they were the that was real. The six day war for them was real. It was the a real threat. That's the position. Are true. Those facts being number one from 1989, which is not a short time ago at this point. Quite a few people on the screen now were not even born in 1989. From 1989, every Russian leader, bar none, was calling for a halt to NATO expansion or was told, this was at the very beginning, that or was promised that there would not be a NATO expansion. Uh, no. I, I don't know what, what else to add to that, but just no. It's not true. Every Russian leader was promised that there would be no NATO expansion. I, I don't even know of, I don't know of anyone who makes this claim. I don't know of any academic that makes it. I mean, he, Norma Fickelstein does love uh, citing authority figures. Um, I would like to see what academic, what historian, what politician, He's referring to to say that every every single one was told that they weren't going to expand NATO. Like from what he said from from 1989 onwards, from right at the collapse of the Soviet Union. So that means that the Soviet Union collapsed. It lost all of its leverage, and every single and just for the, all that time we were just promising them no expansion. What about after the Romanians joined, or after the Hungarians joined, or after the Poles joined? Did we just say, oh, no, that was the last one, I promise? This is just not true. I just, I don't know what he's referring to. The only thing I, I could think that he is referring to, because, again, we let a lot of countries join, and it was an open process. Uh, they voted. They joined. They came to us and requested to join. Uh, the only thing I could imagine he's referring to is that during the reuni reunification of Germany, when the Berlin Wall was crumbling, there was a promise from the West to the Soviet Union that if Germany reunified, that the West would not deploy any NATO bases in East Germany. This is what we know for sure is signed on the dotted line. Then there is speculation that verbally off of paper and which there is no written record of as in like here is the record we promised to do this that verbally and this has been said after the fact that there was an agreement that nato would not expand anywhere past like anywhere east period now there's questions about this primarily like when germany was uni reunifying the idea of the soviet union collapsing was still not there because the soviet union wanted to stay around so the idea of the soviet union agreeing or asking or getting which they didn't get uh, at least on paper as far as we know um we i mean we know for sure it wasn't on paper um they were just they were asking to not expand into territory that was theirs that would be like the united states getting a commitment from the chinese not to put any military bases in nevada it's like well why would they do that before the United States has collapsed and is now a bunch of independent states? Just so that's the only thing I, and again, there is at least some verbal claim that, they, you know, there was a verbal commitment made on that to Gorbachev, but Gorbachev himself clarified in multiple publications that the treaty had to do with East Germany. Uh, I think he flip flop a little bit on it, but we never got a decisive answer. And still, even if I was to say that was what he was referring to, that's a far ride off from every Russian leader was told like, we're not going to expand it. Let me let me just hear that again to make sure that I got that clear. None was calling for a halt to NATO expansion. Oh, every but Russian leader was calling for a halt to NATO expansion. Well, to be clear, we didn't offer a halt to NATO expansion. And when he talked about the Russian leader side, that was the other side of it I didn't talk about yet. That's not necessarily even true in all circumstances with Vladimir Putin saying in 2002 that if Ukraine wanted to join NATO, that's up to Ukraine and the Russians for short stint actually flirting with the idea of NATO membership. But there's a bunch of reasons why I broke down. I don't want to get too, you know, deviated here. Some of it had to do with the, you know, the Russians didn't want to have to like change all of the way they look. I don't want to get too into it. That's a conversation for another day. In 1989, every Russian leader, bar none, 
was calling for a halt to NATO expansion or was told, this was at the very beginning. Oh yeah, right there. Yeah, there it is. That, or was premised. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. He's he's referring to the Gorbachev, because he says right at the very beginning, so I have to imagine he's referring to the Gorbachev thing. That there would not be a NATO expansion. That fact to me, you can go through all the technicalities of whether it was a verbal agreement, whether it was a written agreement, what the archives show, that to me is of secondary importance. It was clear from the get-go beginning with Gorbachev in 1989, okay, there it is. that it the Russians understood there would not be a NATO expansion. Again, this is not accepted by all historians. This is, some people believe this could be true from verbal conversations, but none of it is written record. This is, um, it's one of those things we'll probably never know the real answer for, whether it was something that was said after the fact, after the Soviet Union collapse to try to, you know, try to stop it from like NATO from expanding, or what it was, period. But also, like, even if we had agreed before the Soviet Union collapsed, the entity we negotiated with no longer existed. While the Russians did inherit, you know, that kind of, like, legacy and we negotiated with them, like, us, our security relationship within Europe should change after the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, people might disagree about how it should change, whether it should be, okay, we're abolished NATO, kumbaya, uh, or we're abolished NATO, we're going to form something else, or we're going to expand NATO because people were scared of instability after the Yugoslav civil wars, or they were scared about the Russians coming back because um, something that's often left out is during this period, and I believe it was 1991, the Russians invaded Moldova. And that was a wake-up call for countries like Bulgaria, who I believe it was two years later, or it was 2003, I forget exactly when, but they joined, and when they were asked about what they joined, they said the Russians are getting back on their feet. That's exactly what we're joining. And from the moment the NATO expansion began, the Russians were constantly remonstrating to stop the NATO expansion. Number two, after the, let's just call it, because I don't want to get into a quarrel, on, on semantics, after the non-constitutional change of government in Ukraine in 2014, after that non-constitutional change of government in Ukraine in 2014, a significant part of the Ukrainian government, formal and informal, were not, was now composed of representatives of Nazi or far-right organizations, which were fanatically uh, anti-Russian. Now, oh, when he says government, I don't now. <laughs> okay, so there's a few things I want to say. Him just saying unconstitutional change of power. You know what's what's fascinating about this is that it takes away all the murder. It takes away all the killing, it takes away the beatings, it takes away the flashbangs that were wrapped in nails and those in the crowd, it takes away the gangs that were hired to suppress protesters, it takes away the destruction of protesters' property, including their vehicles, during the Auto Maidan, which is not as uh, well remembered as the Euro Maidan. Uh, the, the sniping, the killing of the Heavenly Hundred, the over 100 people that died, the attempted banning of protests by the Yanukovych government, and not to mention, the, the, not even what started, we didn't even get into what started at all, which was Yanukovych pulling out of the association agreement in the middle of the night so nobody would notice after the parliament had already passed it, he promised on the campaign to do it, and it was overwhelmingly popular after five years of excruciating negotiations so Ukrainians could get access to the European single market for their products and for their travel so that they go through with visa-free tra uh, visa travel so they could work in Europe and try to get a better future for themselves. And he pulled out in the middle of the night, started the protests, reacted with horrible violence. And then, after he tried to ban protests and it backfired, he fled the country because the, the protests were getting out of control. Because he had, he had tried to suppress it, the protests and it backfired. And he fled the country. Then after he fled the country, the Rada uh, voted on a new government, temporary government. There was a Yatsen Yuk prime ministership. And as the Yatsenyuk prime ministership was being installed, the day it was installed, actually, no, the 
night before it was installed, Russian soldiers started taking over parts of Crimea. The day the government he's talking about what's installed, which I assume he's referring to the first Yatsenyuk prime ministership, I don't know if he knows about, I, I don't, again, I don't know Norm Finkelstein's level of knowledge. If he just heard there's Nazis and he just took it, threw it out, if he knows what government he's talking about, the Yatsenyuk prime ministership now, when he's talking about the Nazis, I assume he's talking about Azov militia and stuff like that. So that's soldiers. Those were a lot of them actually outside the purview of the government. They were like private militia fighting the Ukrainian, uh, the Russians as they're coming in. But as for the far right, I will assume, and I'm being charitable here, he's talking about Svoboda. And they did get three ministers in the government because they had like 22% popularity. Uh, they had seats in Narada. And the government made a unity government for a short period of time before they could have elections. Now, I just want to put out there that number one, this period, this government that he's talking about existed for literally just a few months, as in they had the elections in October of that year. And Svoboda, the party that was at, I believe, if you go back to 2012, Svoboda, they were at like 10% here. And during the protests, hell, they even much, they went higher in popularity. They were like 21% in some areas. Then you go to after the revolution, after Euromaidan, when these Nazis were risen in the power, election happened, and what do Ukrainians do? They vote them down. They lose 31 seats, leaving them with six seats because they got 4% of the vote. By the way, since then, they've lost more seats, and they don't have six seats, they have one seat. So, three ministers as part of a government, I don't think is enough justification to invade. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if the Nazi component, or specifically, since we're talking about Svoboda and the actual government, we're not talking about militias, which I will just admit militias in a second. Um, if we're talking about this, if they would have just waited like a few months then boom, Svoboda loses the elections. They actually withdrew from the government, I believe in July, before the elections came around. It was them and Klitschko's party that withdrew from the government. Then boom, they're out of the government. They lose the elections in a massive way and they're gone. So if the problem was the far right individuals in government, all the Russians would have had to do is sit back and do nothing. And they would have, woof which they naturally did anyway. So I would say using that as a justification, I would say is stupid. And as for those who would say, okay, Dylan, but you have to still say they were, they were in there though. Yes, they were in there. Those far right people were in there. But let me just say there, let me just say Marie Le Pen winning an election in France would not be a justification to invade France. That's the first thing. The second thing is, even if they were in there, they didn't get to institute this mass of like far right Nazi policies. In fact, it was, I believe it was the Petro Poroshenko government that instituted non-discrimination protection for LGBT people. So again, I'm not saying that there's no far right problem in Ukraine. I'm not saying there's no Nazis in Ukraine. I'm just saying that that is a justification to invade, I think is bogus. Not to mention the fact when we get to the actual militias, the Russians invaded Ukraine with Nazi militias. So I don't believe that they were invading to fight the Nazi militias with Nazi, with Nazi militias to fight Nazism. I don't believe that. I just don't buy it, okay? I do not believe the American Nazi Party and the Klan got into a fist fight, right? if we're comparing these two things, if, if we accept that these two things are, are the same anyway, which, whatever. But if we accept that, I would not call that a fight for civil rights, would I? Even if I was to accept that on face value. So I don't think that is a good moral justification. I think denazification is a crock of shit. Now, I'm not going to go into the percentages, but in my opinion... By the way, we just went to the percentages for this exact reason, because it, I think it that context does add, I think, how people think about this than when you just say what Finkel just said. ...opinion, it's not open to debate, that because it's a factual matter, that critical security and military positions in the government after the unconstitutional change of government belong to far-right Nazi parties. Okay, when he says far-right Nazi parties, now I'm more confused as to what he means. I said, I'm assuming he's just talking about Svoboda then, right? So, Svoboda, they had those positions, but the Russians were also sending in their 
Nazi militias, and then Svoboda lost those positions immediately in the next parliamentary elections because most Ukrainians didn't want them. So whether or not those people were in those positions of power, I don't think has any impact on whether or not the Russians invade or not. That's fact number two. Fact number three was Russia made clear that- the And again, the Russians started taking over parts of Crimea on the night of the 26th. The 27th was when the government was announced. Expansion of NATO to Georgia and Ukraine would be red lines for them. In particular, with Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine share about a thousand mile border. Note in 2002, this was not the case for Putin. Putin changed his rhetoric on this years later after a relationship between the West and Russia soured. I can't remember now, but it's a thousand, I think it's 900 mile border. And there was significant concern about US NATO missiles being placed along that border within five minutes distance of key Russian cities. So there's a few there's a few things that I think about when I hear this. The first thing is, and this is something that just come to me recently, why would the United States make Ukraine give up its nuclear arsenal and give it to the Russians to only then pursue a decades long strategy? or half decade, however you want to call it, whenever the scheme started, to then bring nuclear weapons back to Ukraine after the Russians had gotten back on their feet, reorganized, brought back together the military, and got their economy in order, then say when we could have maybe much more easily have accomplished said goal when they were disorientated, in economic collapse, and their military couldn't even invade Chechnya, let alone all of Ukraine with the United States backing the sole geopolitical hegemon of the world, at the time at least. So I just, to some, something that reflects on me, or makes me think, because we literally went out of our way, we told the Ukrainians, if you do not give the Russians the nuclear arsenal, which some of you believe you could use to stop a Russian invasion, then we will make you an international pariah. They then gave it up, and wouldn't you know it, the Russians then invaded them in 2014. So just, that's one element that doesn't make sense to me. Another element that doesn't make sense to me is, even if I wanted Ukraine to be in NATO, or the United States wanted Ukraine to be in NATO, you need to get the permission of every NATO country in order to make that happen. If the Russians' main concern was just stopping Ukraine from joining NATO, they could have achieved that by continuing to subsidize and help Viktor Orban. They could have achieved that by continuing to keep Olaf Scholz antsy about Ukrainian NATO membership, or the Social Democrats, or Angela Merkel, or any of these people who were integrating themselves with the Russians economically, giving them a ton of trade, resource, and economic leverage over them. That's not even to talk about French opposition, Spanish opposition, or the opposition of other countries that were against the idea of Ukrainian NATO membership. And so there's a problem of we took the missiles that they would be scared of out of Ukraine in the first place and then gave them to Russia. Fun fact, they then used many of those missiles to then bomb Ukraine without the with just by just by replacing the warheads, putting a more traditional unitary munition on there and then launching into major Ukrainian cities. Just want to throw that out there. So we stopped that from happening in the first place. Uh, we man. OK, I think. I don't want to ramble too much. I've been going on a lot on this point. So let's just keep moving. It's just the nuclear missile thing doesn't fly with me because Ukraine wasn't close to joining NATO and we removed the, the missiles out of there in the first place. And again, when this whole war started back in 2014, Ukraine was not close to joining NATO. Not at all. And they said when they were about to get invaded, the Yatsenyuk government told the Russians, we will, we're willing to negotiate with you. In fact, let me bring this out. This is right after Euromaidan. This is right after Euromaidan. Acting Foreign Minister of Ukraine has once again stated that the new Ukrainian government is not intended to lead Ukraine into NATO. We are considering all options regarding the strengthening of our security and collective security, but we must stick to the existing legislation of Ukraine, he said at a press conference in Kiev on Saturday. The official noted that in accordance with Ukrainian legislation, Ukraine is a non-aligned state. But the issue whether to change this legislation depends on the Ukrainian parliament. The program of the new Ukrainian government does not contain the intention of becoming a NATO state. Now, whether or not you say, oh, this is wiggly, like they're not promising they will never join NATO in this. 
Of course it's wiggly. The Ukrainians want to have leverage. If the Ukrainians just come out of the gate saying, okay, Russia, we won't join NATO, please, please, please don't bomb us. Then the Russians are like, okay, we already got this commitment. Let's see what else we can get out of them. How about you have to pay us this much for oil? How about we have to, we can transit oil across Ukraine into Europe with lower payments? Or how about no payments at all? Well, how about you give us, so, I mean, whether whether or not this could have been negotiated, if they sat down, the Russians after Euromaidan didn't even try after the government offered to. So again, this this image he painted at the start, which was remember the Six Day War and what the what the Israelis said about the 1967 war. Remember what they said about that, saying that it was an existential crisis. Well, that was nonsense, but it's true here. It's true here that it was existential for the Russians, while the Ukrainians are saying, hey, you know, actually maybe we don't need to be in NATO and let's negotiate, let's have a conversation. And the Russians are taking over Crimea. And the Russians are invading. They're moving troops in. They're pushing troops into the Donbass. They're pushing arms into the Donbass. All of which they were denying while they were doing it. Beyond that, there was the attempts again by Russia at the end of December 2021, going into February 2022, of proposing various uh, diplomatic settlements of the conflict. And the steady response of the NATO head, Jens Stoltenberg, to every proposal that was made by Russia, Stoltenberg replied, and here I'll give you as close as I can to a verbatim statement. He said, everything between NATO and any other government is our business, not yours. And the Russians made two proposals, one to NATO and one directly to the US, and the response by NATO was, we will not promise, we will not promise that missiles will not be uh, um, stationed in Ukraine. They said, we reserve the right to station defensive missiles. Now, when you're, when you're within five minutes of Russia, Russia's major cities, the distinction between offensive and defensive missiles, I think, but I'm not a military person, but I think any reasonable person would say that distinction is meaningless. And secondly, Okay, so... Let me just throw out there that there is a question about air defense, but I don't know what missile, I don't know what statement about missiles he's referring to. But to be clear, when he's saying the Russians tried diplomacy, are you telling me seriously that when the Russians invaded Crimea, they couldn't have gotten a commitment after they took over Crimea out of the Ukraine or couldn't have sat down to at least tried to get a commitment? On like, hey, you know what? No missiles on the territory. Or hey, you know what? No NATO membership would give you back Crimea. But they didn't. And they didn't because it wasn't just about NATO membership. Who knows how much of a role that actually played. It was also revanchism. It was also hardcore nationalism. It was this belief that Russia had a right to that land, just like Putin believes Russia has a right to all the land in Ukraine. He believes that Ukraine is an extension of Russia. NATO responded that we will station troops in Ukraine, not on a permanent basis, but on a rolling basis. That means We'll station some troops, then replace them with other troops, then replace them with other troops. Um, but the bottom line is clear. There will be NATO missiles and NATO troops. You know what? You know what the compromise could be here? No NATO missiles, but some NATO troops. 1,000 to 1,500, just like there's been in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania without wars. And that the troop deployment would not be, hey, this is a troops that could invade Russia. 1,500 troops couldn't do shit. They would act as a tripwire, making the Russians know that if they invaded Ukraine, then, well, they would lose. So, but the thing is, if you don't, I'm not that they would lose, but that they would, sorry, I fumbled my words. Not that they would lose, but that they would have to go to war with the United States. That they'd have to go to war with NATO because they're firing on NATO troops. It acts as a tripwire. That's why we don't have to have like 50 to 100,000 troops in Estonia, but we can defend them with like a thousand soldiers. It's because there's an implied tie to the United States army by just having those some troops there that oh these troops get attacked the rest of the armed forces will come and so if nato was to promise if ukraine was to join nato that they wouldn't be able to deploy troops in ukraine then they wouldn't be able to add that same defensive protection that they've given to estonia latvia and lithuania successfully as for the missiles i'd have to look more into it but again i failed to see how the russians couldn't have in the any time like the eight years since then written up some agreement of fine here's back crimea fine here's back donetsk and luhansk here's back the territory on the condition no missiles or on the condition that you know what you, you can have some relationship with nato just like you have some relationship with up but that wasn't offered because they don't want to give that back they want the land and they want ukraine to not be 
ingrained with the West. And eventually, at least this is my belief, they want Ukraine to be ingrained with Russia. Putin says that Ukraine can only exist as an extension of Russia. What started this whole thing was Yanukovych pulling out of the association agreement because the Russians, which while violating a treaty, while violating the treaty they signed in the 90s, were engaging in economic coercion of the Ukrainians to make them not integrate themselves economically with Europe and to instead uh, integrate themselves with the Russians because that served their interests. Stationed in Ukraine. Now, I'll let it say for the last, the last point of the comparison. And the last point of the comparison is this. When Aben made his speeches at the UN, Abba Aben, the Israeli foreign minister, when he made his speeches, he kept referring- By the way, when he says, def when they say defensive missiles, I just want to throw out there, I don't know if they mean patriots, which would be literally defensive missiles, or he means d offensive, defensive, like nuclear weapons, like the type of stuff that would, you know, to try to dissuade an invasion through like the terror of nuclear. I don't know because I know we've given Ukraine Patriot missiles. I just don't. I, I literally don't know. By that, the way, Patriot missiles were integral for Ukraine's defense. So the idea of a defensive missile isn't that crazy. Just throwing that out there. It's again, it depends on what he's referring to. Back to the Nazi Holocaust and the extermination of between five and six million Jews, and he was saying that Israel now faces another Holocaust. So that served as the backdrop, that served as the backdrop for his defense of Israel to launch the attack. Now, as I said, if you go through the evidence, everything Abba Aben said about the blockade of the Straits of Tehran, about the Egyptian troops in the Sinai, about the pact with Jordan, all of it was nonsense. However, it served to make a compelling case. And I say, just as Israel had the right to invoke the backdrop of the Nazi Holocaust, Russia has the right to invoke the fact that 27 million, that's the current number, 27 million Soviet people were exterminated during World War II. Russia on the east, excuse me, Germany. Okay, I'm sorry. This is like levels of Russian government simpage that I didn't expect to see from this guy. This is Norman Finkelstein, supposed anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist professor, quite literally regurgitating imperialist propaganda that the mighty Russians, the Russians have the right to cite the suffering of World War II while invading Ukraine. They have a right to cite the suffering of World War II. Now, I don't know if you guys knew this, and I hate to burst the bubble, but the Ukrainians were the centerpiece of Lebensraum, the centerpiece of the Nazi plans. The Nazis never cared about the middle of Siberia. The Nazis never cared about fucking Tuvalu or uh, all the way over in what they would probably be, like ja the Japanese can have. They cared about the areas that were fit for the German Volk, the German settlers. That's where they cared about. That's the areas they wanted. Uh, the rest of it, who cares? Now, maybe they'd want it for some strategic reasons, positioning reasons, but when it comes to what they wanted to, to complete the Labatron project, Ukraine was essential. Ukraine was referred to as the breadbasket of Europe and is still referred to as the breadbasket of Europe for a reason. And so if you're a German settler, what a better place to settle than the breadbasket of Europe? That means the death squads, that were also extremely brutal in Belarus, were horrible, horrible, awful in Ukraine, destroying and decimating the Jewish community, which had already been heavily hurt by pogroms by both the Red Army and the White Army during the Russian Civil War. They went through and forcefully in, in, in grabbed and forced into hard labor, tons and tons and tons of Ukrainians, killed civilians, put people, uh, grabbed people and deported them to concentration camps, killed people with death squads. They did horrible things to Ukraine. So now we're gonna have the Russians, by the way, the Nazis occupied Ukraine longer than they, than they never got to Moscow and they never took Moscow. So, I mean, the, the Nazis occupied Ukraine for about like two to three years. That's a long time to be under Nazi occupation. They know the brutality of Nazi occupation. They, there's, no, there's no citing it against them because they felt it firsthand. That's like two abused children. One turns to the other and says, I, I hate you because I was abused. Excuse me? Excuse 
I was beaten too. In fact, I was the first one that was beaten. Before they came to beat you, I was in the way. I got beaten first on the way to beat you. What do you mean? It, it's not, it's not, it, nah, nah, nah. That's not even talking about Soviet collaboration at the start of the war, but you cannot cite this as any type of reason or backdrop for the invasion of Ukraine, especially when the Russians are arming neo-Nazi militias like Rusic. You can Google them yourself. There's a name you can go look up, which are fighting since 2014, the very start, and are still fighting today, releasing guides on how to execute Ukrainian soldiers and not get caught using phone books to make sure that the burns, when you put it to their head and pull the trigger, the burns of the muzzle doesn't leave a mark. Posting that publicly with no repercussion, even when it's highlighted by Russian bloggers in the press. Look, I'm just saying that if we're going to be talking about World War II, maybe we should refer to the mass graves that are popping up, like the mass grave in Bucha, which I had the unpleasant experience of visiting, or the mass grave in, uh, in Izium. Over 440 bodies, largest mass grave in Europe since the Yugoslav genocides. The majority civilian, many with their eyes tied behind their back and shot in the back of the head. If we're making World War II comparisons here, I would say the mass graves is probably where we should start. On the Eastern Front, fought a war of extermination. They wanted to create what they called Lebensraum, living space for Germans and expanding German population. And so they proceeded to engage in a war of annihilation, a war of extermination. Against the Ukrainians as well, by the way, they also believed that the Ukrainians were the same untermensch inferiors to them, just like the Russians were. And the Russians... They were some who believed some weird different thing because they had, they had worked with like the Galician SS or something, and they were like, oh, well, maybe they're so bad. But the vast majority in Hitler's position was still that the Ukrainians were inferior. Soviet people suffered a loss, not quite the magnitude of the Nazi Holocaust directed at Jews, but certainly of a magnitude, which in my opinion, justify its right to say, sorry, Mr. Stoltenberg, but stationing missiles in Ukraine on our border, which in a matter of time, almost certainly would be nuclear tip missiles. How would you know that? What type of missiles? And how would you know that? We don't, do we have, okay, one second. Does America have nuclear missiles in Estonia? Do we know for sure that we even have nuclear weapons in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania? I don't think we know that. We, we either, there's multi, I don't think there's nuclear weapons in Finland. I don't think there's nuclear weapons in Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania. These are all countries that border, border Russia. Why couldn't it just be the same, where there's a small deployment of 1,000 to 2,000 troops that can act as a trigger if the Russians were to invade, just like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania? Look up NATO nuclear sharing. Yep, let me, NATO nuclear sharing. There we go. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Uh, it doesn't say where it is. Uh, nuclear deterrence also relies on U.S. nuclear weapons deployed in Europe and supporting capabilities infrastructure provided. It doesn't say where, though. I know we have nuclear weapons in Europe, and I know we specifically have a lot of tactical nuclear weapons deployed in Europe. Um, because that was like the centerpiece of like our Cold War strategy if the Russians were to evade due to the populate or due to the, you know, army size advantage that they could have fighting European armies. I just, okay, here we go. Nuclear sharing. So nuclear weapon free zone. So other NPT parties. So nuclear sharing is with Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Italy, Turkey, but not Ukraine. Not Estonia, not Latvia, not Lithuania. Doesn't seem to include any of the countries that are bordering Russia. But I will say, look at that. Belarus, they're nuclear sharing with the Russians right on Poland's border. Look, all I'm saying is the idea that there could be a treaty negotiated where the Ukrainians don't have nuclear weapons in there and that any missiles, including things like Patriot air defense, necessarily means nuclear weapons are going to be deployed there, I think is... Uh, <laughs> Not true. I, I don't know how to, I'm trying not to sound like an asshole when I say it. It's just, he's jumping to conclusions he doesn't have the right to jump to and hasn't laid out how he knows. You start with Patriot Air Defense and then before you know it, you have nuclear missiles blow up Moscow.
it is our business. It is our business. And in light of that, I believe they have the right to attack. Should they have? I don't know. I'm not a military person, but I don't accept the argument because I do not believe it makes logical sense. I do not accept the argument that, yes, it's true. Russia provoked. Yes, it's true. Russia provoked. Yes, it's true. Russia provoked. But then after listing the 10,000 Russian provocations, we then hear, but the invasion was criminal. That doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't compute. Unless you can show me, unless you can show me a significant option, a significant non-violent. 2014, right after your Ramadan, Ukrainian government weak, only had about 16,000 soldiers that could actually defend the country. The government tells the Russians, hey, we're willing to negotiate NATO status. We're willing to negotiate these things. In this position of weakness, what do the Russians do? As the government's being informed and negotiate that would, the government that would negotiate with the Russians given the circumstances, given the economic coercion they were given in at the time, what did the Russians do? They took advantage of the situation, invaded Crimea. That was the moment they could have negotiated. They also could have negotiated to return Crimea and return the Donbass in the preceding eight years. When Zelensky was elected, Zelensky was originally elected on a pro-peace, pro-negotiation platform. Now, to be clear, he didn't win because of that. He won because he wasn't Petro Poroshenko, he wasn't tied to the political establishment, and he wasn't an oligarch. That's why Zelensky won. Because he was a, a presidential, uh, you know, he was a president on TV, and that's what he was. He was on a TV show about being the president, being, become, then became the president. And he wasn't tied to the political elite. Many people saw it in the same way as kind of like a Molotov cocktail to the establishment. But he was still running on a pro-peace platform. And he did attempt to negotiate ever since he was elected up until the 2022 invasion. So that was a point where they could have tried to negotiate the return of Crimea in that area in return for some sort of NATO, uh, you know, you know, maybe won't be a NATO, et cetera, et cetera. But the Russians didn't have any interest in even considering giving NATO back because they had already in their legal system formalized the annexation of Crimea. They already formalized the annexation of Crimea. So international law be damned, you know, Ukrainian perspective be damned, all those people who got killed and occupied territory, all the people who fled be damned. I'm just, the idea that, Oh, the, the Russians, you know, went out there and negotiated, negotiated, negotiated. You want to know how many times they negotiated? 200 rounds of negotiation. 20 negotiated ceasefires. 20 negotiated ceasefires. I think there was a lot of points. A lot of points where they could have disengaged and tried to use their leverage in occupying territory, possibly, to get this objective. If it's just NATO expansion, I mean, do you really not think that a serious offer of fun will withdraw from all occupied territory if you promise to not be in NATO? That wouldn't even be considered certainly hasn't been offered. Diplomatic option that Russia had, but didn't exercise. If you can show me a significant option that Russia had, but- It didn't, it did, when the Ukrainian government said, let's negotiate, after Euromaidan, they said no, and they invaded Ukraine. There you go. Done. Didn't need to go to Harvard, Yale, or the Brookings Institute, or any of those places to figure that out. You know what I needed to go to? My TV. Type in news reports around that time and just watch it. If you were just around at the time and you were just following it closely, this would be stuff you would know. I wasn't. I had to find out all this stuff after the fact. Norm is much older than me. If he's going to talk about this, he doesn't have an excuse. But then exercise, then of course, my argument is not compelling. But so far as I could tell... Other books I recommend, I don't have them behind me, but The War That Came to Us... And um, our enemies will vanish. Our enemies will vanish, especially, I think, is really good for highlighting this negotiation period. All I heard was... But both of them are good. Russia ne needed to give more time to diplomacy. More time to diplomacy. I'm thinking to myself, more time to diplomacy. This is the same naive... I just... I think it's naive. If we just talked to the Russians more, this all would have been better. I just find it naive. I should think... More than 30 years, three decades, is an awful lot of time. Three decades, that's an awful lot of time. And if they miss one possible option, one tiny option, which I don't even know what it is, but if they missed it... Dude, she, to how... Again, this is not something he specializes in. This is something he's completely shooting off the hip. Let me be clear. When he was on the Destiny show... Or not the Destiny Show, the Lex Friedman Show, Destiny, Benny Morris, all those people on there. The 30,000 dead in Gaza was used as evidence 
of genocide. Putting out there, genocide, atrocities, all the such. The AP estimate, and I'm not trying to do the comparison. I'm just saying it feels like for Norm. This is not about comparing the two things. They're both awful, awful wars bringing untold suffering to human beings and children. There's no, like, that's not my point. My point is talking about Norm's double standard. And that 30,000 number was used as evidence for genocide. AP estimates that Mariupol, one city alone, that the mass grave count by using satellite data, satellite photographs to track the expansion of mass graves around Mariupol, 30,000 to 75,000 dead. Those are the mass grave tracking. That does, that's, by the way, that does, that's just tracking the mass graves. It could be worse. It could be worse than that for the stuff we haven't seen. And that's just Mariupol. We're not talking about other areas. We're not talking about other areas that were occupied. We already saw what was unveiled in the areas that we've liberated like Izium with the mass grave. And so we know that the Russian government has said, if you do not accept Russian citizenship, skedaddle or possible repercussions. That's the, the date for that is speeding up close. It's going to be in June and July. We know that the Russian government, Vladimir Putin, signed an executive order saying that he can take away the property rights of anybody without Russian citizenship. So that means that if you are living in a village in the countryside, a village, by the way, like Metiopol, well, that's a, not a village, but more of a city. But let's say you live out in the village or Metiopol, any of these places where the majority of the population there supports Ukraine, Ukrainian speaking villages. Not saying that somebody just because they speak Russian they necessarily support Russia, but you, a lot of these are Ukrainian speaking villages are going to be having Russians coming to them, Russian agents, Russian soldiers coming to them saying, if you do not accept this citizenship, we're going to take your house and you're deported and we're going to give your house to a settler. What does that sound like? What does that sound like? What does that sound like to you guys? I know what it sounds like to me. What does that sound like to you guys? Does that sound colonial in any manner? Could you say that, you know, there's a type of uh, uh, cleansing of culture, of language, an attempt to eradicate it from occupied territories, to move out the population, to take one ethnicity and move them away? To move them away due to disloyalty in said ethnicity? Does this get a mention by Norman Finkelstein? Anything? No, nothing, not a peep. But when I watch him on the Lex Friedman show, he's taken out diaries to read descriptions of the Israeli invasion of Southern Lebanon, where a lot, where war crimes were committed, horribly brutal. Where was that? There was none of that, like, let's listen to the people on the ground. Let's listen to these. There was none of that here. This is another example of a professor and again, putting aside any of my beliefs or anybody else's beliefs about his commentary on the Israel-Palestine war, this is an example of somebody leaving the areas of expertise and then opening their mouth too wide and being too loud about things they don't know about. That's how I read this. That's how I read this. Norman's gotten a little, um, what's the term? Big for his britches. I find it far-fetched in the extreme. Far-fetched in the extreme given that track record that the U.S. or NATO would have agreed to it. I see no basis for that fact. The U.S. was determined with- This is a very, by the way, I, this is a given, but a lot of this is very cherry picked. There's so much information that is not included here, whether about how the negotiations went, um, what local Ukrainian sources say, or like, or the illegal Russian deployments of military, uh, of the military into Ukraine over the last eight years, over the last 10 years, actually. I think it's a lot of this is cherry picked information as well. NATO, they were determined to subordinate Russia, to put Russia in a position that it would have to accept any ultimatum coming from the U.S. and NATO, or else face military might on its border. And Man, dude, I just God, I I I want to meet the United States that Norm is talking about. I want to meet the United States that its policy is, yes, Russia, we're going to put nukes in Ukraine. We know we made them give them your nukes in the 90s, but we've decided that Clinton is a pansy. 
and we don't like what Clinton did in giving up them nukes, so we're going to actually give them new nukes. And if you do anything about it, well, Joe Biden's going to take the Ranger Corps, he's going to take the Navy SEALs, he's going to take a thousand Abram tanks, and he's going to smash them, smash them into Kursk, and he's going to do what the German generals call. Like, that is, like, this, this, this doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. This USA, he's, he's painting. If this was true, and, you know, a lot of theories about us overthrowing the Ukrainian government, the unconstitutional shape, whatever you want to refer to it. After that happened, we left the Ukrainians up shit creek for like eight years. We did some things. We did some training operations, intelligence sharing. We sh finally, under the Trump administration, sh shipped them some weapons like javelins, which they use to defend themselves. But if, if what is being said is true, why didn't we jump at the opportunity under the Obama administration? If what he's saying is true, why was it that the leaked Victoria Newland phone call, which had no reason to be posted to the public, was leaked? So it's not like she was putting on an act, seemed to indicate that they wanted the protesters to take the deal with Yanukovych, accept it, allow Yanukovych to stay in power until new elections, which the protesters didn't want, which pushed them to keep protesting, especially after the anti-protest laws were introduced. Anyway, we're about, we're almost done, so let's wrap this up. There is no way in my opinion, that any offer the Russians made short of surrender would have evoked a positive reaction from the West. I he just so, he, dude, I can smell the horse hockey that is filled up to his neck. I can smell it coming off the screen. I see no evidence of that. Okay, now fire away and tell me everything I said that was wrong. Everything. And we already covered it. Anyway, that's enough of that.